podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 48 of The Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at working with shame in the therapy relationship. Yes, a very important topic. Yes. One that's been written about a lot. And um, shame, I think, is often the forgotten emotion. Yeah. It's not written about enough. It, it, it should be on the, that topic should be in every psychotherapy training, training program for students. Because shame will always be there. And often shame lurks in the shadow. Yes. Yeah. Now the antidote to shame is love and compassion. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting one, shame and guilt and those sort of things that again, you know, we, we often talk about bringing the past into the present. So, you know, that's quite a big thing, you know, for somebody to walk in through the door um, and, and talk to a complete stranger to start off with. But then often, I find with clients when they do open up and when we have had a breakthrough, there's an awful lot of guilt and shame about, about that. You know, and sometimes clients even talking about their upbringing and their past and, and what happened to them. There's a lot of guilt about, you know, maybe betraying certain family members or their parents or, you know, the, the relationship, whatever it is. Do you think shame goes hand in hand with therapy? Hand in hand with what? Do, do you think shame is part of being in a therapeutic process? No, not necessarily. I, I, I think the number one question um, concerning the treatment of shame is to consider whose shame it is. Mm. Interesting. That's the number one question to think about clinically. I mean, it's important, obviously, to hear the story and help the person understand themselves. But if you start considering, well, whose shame is it? That's a very good place to start. Okay. Say a little bit more. Are you saying whose shame is it, as in it's kind of been inherited through the family? For most, pe for most people... They carry the burden of shame um, for, a, for a misconceived place. In other words, they think it's their fault. Yeah. They think um, the shame is, is intrinsically theirs, when actually the shame has come from other people who should be very, very ashamed. Yeah. Okay. But they take it on because they believe that whatever the trauma was or whatever the situation was, they were the people to blame and they were the ones that it was their fault, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So if you can start to think about it that way, that, you know, we're into a, um, a whole process about eventually the person taking some ownership of what the shame's about and where the shame came from and hopefully giving it eventually back to the place where it should actually reside. Yeah. And it's usually it's not on them. Yeah. But they but the client takes it on because yeah. they believe they're at fault or they're to blame or or something like that. Yeah. Because they've been told it, whether that's you know actual with words, it's your fault that this happened or whether it was just insinuated in their past and in their upbringing, being the oh. black sheep of the family, things like that, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so it's very important to help the client work out and understand, uh, you know, where the shame comes from. 
and whose shame it is. Yeah. Because it's usually not the clients. Yeah. So what do, what do we do with it? How do we help a client work through that? Well, we yeah. Shame, goodness gracious me. It, you are quite right. It usually comes when the client believes or has taken on the action or the trauma or whatever we're talking about here as their fault. Yeah. If we can actually help them understand that actually the shame comes from somewhere else and it needs to be given back to that person, then you can move to actionistic therapy where you actually give the shame back to the person who passed the shame onto them. Yeah. Again, it's, I would imagine it's a slow process. Oh, shame is because just by walking in for therapy, people often get very shamed because they think there's something wrong with them to become in therapy in the first place. Yeah. So it's a very slow process on picking shame and how it's held in the body and what it's about. And that's why I said it's a forgotten emotion in many ways, because people, uh, because well, another way of looking at this, it's hidden. It's often hidden. Yeah. Uh, in areas of the body or held in areas of the body or not talked about or lurk, lurking in dark shadows. So it's the therapist's job really to help light go into the areas of darkness where we can get to where the shame is lurking. Yeah. And as it, I said, love and, love and compassion is the antidote to shame. Yeah. From the therapist to start off with, but I would imagine it's the client showing themselves love and compassion. Yeah, but you see, Jackie, they can only get there one way, in my opinion. And that's when they experience love, be love being bestowed on them. Yeah. So if they experience the therapist being compassionate and loving them, yeah, then they are, they are likely to be able to have that internal process themselves. Yeah. So that's why this is a relational psychotherapy. Yes. Yeah. And it's difficult for, for clients that do have overwhelming shame. Like you said, it's the unforgotten, you know, emotion and it, it does reside in the dark recesses of a person to to unlock that and to let that go is is quite difficult for some people when they've they've you know they've carried it for so long it, it it's kind of defines who they are as a person sometimes yes yeah. oh, uh, oh undoubtedly another aspect of this is what i would call normalization it's because quite often people are carrying shame uh, often because they've been, as I said, they've been told it's their fault, et cetera, et cetera. But also that, that they have outdated information or they, 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 they really ha uh, don't have a sense of normalization about what's normal, about often what they're talking about. Um, and then they blame themselves yeah. for what might be a normal developmental action yeah i have worked with clients that have an awful lot of shame yeah and so that in a dialogue that critical parent that is constantly you know they second guess every move that they make in all relationships and oh. you know the, the one time that I don't know, somebody doesn't answer the phone to them. It's it's overwhelming that, you know, the sense of shame and guilt that they've done something wrong. It's their fault. What did they do? You know, constantly going back over, you know, past interactions. Did I say the right thing? What did, did I do something wrong? Have I upset them? All those sort of things. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So it, it's... To, to unlock that and I completely agree with what you're saying you know showing love and compassion and normalizing that 
you know, there's something for me about does the the person's ego come into it to a certain extent? As in, you know, if they're questioning every interaction with a person that they are responsible for how that conversation goes or it's their responsibility that everything goes okay is that their ego that's coming out as well i'm not sure the question but i'm going to answer it answer what i think you're getting at by saying this if somebody comes in with a very shame-based system which usually built around the messages that they're not okay. Yeah. Everything's their fault. These type of people have very diminished ego. In other words, they are internally telling themselves off. Yeah. Um, they've had a life where people in reality probably um, punished them, burden them down. And so their ego becomes lower and lower and self-esteem is very low. So it's the opposite, I think, of what you're saying. Their ego doesn't suddenly become very high because they had, they feel worthless, they feel devalued, they feel a lack of self-esteem, they feel worthless. Not the opposite. Okay, but one of the things I say to all my clients, really, is that there's two people in a relationship and we're responsible for 50% of that and the other person is responsible for 50% of it. You know, the interactions go backwards and forwards. Oh, I don't agree with that. I'll tell you what I mean by that is... It is developmentally that's certainly not true because you know you've had children you've got yeah. children i don't know how many children you've got but i know you've got one or two haven't you i've got three yeah so when you're the parent you're anticipating the unmet needs of your child yeah our dynamics are particularly one way so that so often the child has no choice now, in a healthy situation like yours, hopefully your family, my family, there's an emphasis on self-definition, self-agency and understanding of developmental processes. But for a lot of family situations, especially when the mother or father might be sharing their child, the, the power dynamics are one up, one down. The, the, the child doesn't have the choice that you're talking about. No, but as an adult... Maybe as an adult, but they, they carry their youngest child with them yeah which again is that bringing the past into the the present yeah. and things so they don't feel they have a choice often yeah but for somebody to take on all the responsibility of every interaction that they have that they that's get what shame people often exactly. do yes it's put on them yes yeah so it is important i agree with you to get to what i said at the beginning you're saying it perhaps a different way around to me uh which is to find out whether shame came from in the beginning yes yeah but again you know it, it's kind of like another way of showing love and compassion and grounding them and you know getting them in the here and now and in the adult part is is for them as an adult and you know age appropriate to what they are now to understand that it's not their responsibility to make everybody okay and for everybody oh, yes. to be happy oh, and thank you you know, th those right. sort of things. And that sometimes people have a different opinion to us and might take umbrage to what we're doing. I understand exactly what you're saying, that because of how they were in their childhood and maybe, you know, exactly like you say, it was a one-upmanship, you know, there was a power dynamic. Yeah, I see, I know where you're coming from. However, I think developmentally, in other words, I think what you're talking about is is further forward. Often. Yeah. The, the, if you're working developmentally over time, you're working with a younger child first and then eventually work up to the position you're talking about. Yeah. And your position you're talking about, I think, is a great position to come to, but they're often not ready to get there. No, no. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a working process. I, I understand that. But, you know, to give them permission to sometimes get it wrong in the therapy room. Oh, yes. That, yes. It's OK. None of us get it right 100 percent of the time. You know, if if the client is constantly asking for permission or, you know, you to take the lead in every conversation because they don't want to get it wrong. Hmm. 
you know, to give them permission to run the session sometimes even. Mm. Oh, permissions are very important if you don't overwhelm them. Yeah. But, but, but you know, I quite agree with you. You know, permissions um, at the right time clinically are vital in the treatment of somebody who comes from a shame-based system. Yeah. Because a shame-based somebody who's been really shamed has never had permissions to be themselves. <coughs> yeah. And again, like you say, it can be overwhelming sometimes to have that permission. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So there's a there's a what there's a lot to be written on shame. In fact, on my website, I've got an article, Shame, the Forgotten Emotion. But I think that shame is such an all-pervasing emotion that comes with a lot of the clients that will come through our room. You know, if you've got that sort of system, you're going to have low self-esteem. Yeah. You're going to be telling yourself off a lot. Yeah. You'll be looking for situations where to be shamed or where you experience being shamed. You're going to feel worthless, not value yourself and all the things that go with that. And that leads to pretty poor mental health. Yeah. Yeah, and it affects relationships and everything, yeah. And like you say, I, I, I like that, you know, the, the phrase that you said, it's the forgotten emotion. Mm. People need to think about it a lot. Yeah. And it, 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 in a way, you, you are right to a large degree that a lot of the conditions our clients come in with, shame will probably be lurking somewhere there in the darkness. But I do know one thing, that if you shine, shine light into the darkness, it'll, the, sh the shame can often shrivel up and go skulking away. Yeah. And that light you're talking about, love and compassion. Hmm. yeah I love that yeah hmm. and you know I, I I like to think that in the therapy room it's probably <clears throat> one of the few places where the I'm okay you're okay is is alive and well in that room <laughs> hmm. yeah love has to be there yeah passion has to be there now whether the client is ready to take that's another story already but the intent needs to be there if nothing else. Yeah. If we don't love our clients, I don't know where we go. And I also think we wouldn't be in this business, but the, we need to understand the clinical process about people who have never felt loved. Being able to experience love is another whole story, but I think the intent needs to be there. Yeah. Yeah, because again, like you say, it can be overwhelming. Oh, of course. Sometimes. Yeah, even well, having eye contact sometimes. Yeah, it, 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 by definition, Jackie, by definition. doesn't mean that the intent can't be there, though. No. But there needs to be a clinical understanding. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember what one of the looks after kids that we had, that, you know, if ever, if ever I was... I don't know, making him feel a little bit uncomfortable maybe with emotions. He would talk to me through a door or behind a wall. He he, he couldn't even stand in front of me when he was talking. One of the, the, there was two times that we used to have really, you know, good conversations. One was when I was driving because I could, I could only look forward and I couldn't actually look at him when he was talking. And the other was he used to help me cook Sunday dinner so if he was stirring the gravy and doing something he would be talking with me but not actually face to face it was one of the things i think that he always struggled with hmm. it was well, a bit intense he, for him sometimes i think yeah because i suspect the biggest message she got was around not existing yeah yeah it literally was as if he needed to hide away or just disappear yeah the only way you could survive. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Needless to say, it didn't last that long. <laughs> what didn't? 
he, him staying behind the doors and things like that. It was. Oh, he did a good job then, by sounds of it. Well, it took a while. It did take a while, but with lots of exactly like you say, love and compassion. Mm. You know, the he did come out of his shell. Yeah. Yeah, it can be very tested because, you know, um, you know, people and particularly this this sort of area we're talking about, the clients will try and make you shame them if that makes sense yeah because that's what they expect yeah and so, it's familiar and they know how to be in that yeah. situation yeah yeah so i do think there needs to be a really good clinical understanding of how to work with shame and the treatment of shame yeah yeah and like you said, there, there are some good things written. So on your, your website, what is your website, Bob, just for the people that are listening, if they want to go and look at... All oh, right. I think it's uh, on, on the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy website, but I also have a personal website called bobcook.org. And, of course, I have a YouTube with 300-odd videos. Yeah. So the article, I think, is on the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy. Um, it could be on the Bob Cook one. So I'm not sure. I wrote it a long time ago um, because I specialised a lot on the treatment of shame. Yeah, a lot's been written of it on it now, uh, with thank goodness. But when I started off in 1985, it wasn't even in the psychotherapy training program I embarked on. Now in 2002, with some much more, yeah, talked about, documented subject. Yeah, and you know. I, I think, again, I think you probably are right. I mean, I, I was thinking when you said earlier on, but I think most conditions that people come with, they bring an element of shame with them. And often a really big, a big one, well, what, what it gets played out on is uh, a shame of having to come to therapy in the first place. Yeah. In other words, being vulnerable, um, feeling there's something wrong with them, that they're crazy. That's why they're coming to therapy. It's like a double-edged sword. Yes. And that has to be addressed over time. Yeah. And I, I think, you, you, you know, you, you touched on it there, that, that vulnerability is kind of connected with shame a lot of the time. Yeah, because, you know, the way that a lot of people do with shame is to go underground, mm. to hide, um, to be... To attempt to not be there, um, not to be exposed. Yeah. All the things that we know about the consequences of shame. So we need to understand that that whole perspective, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking when you were talking then about, you know, shame and, and trauma and all those sorts of things. Do, you know, my my son is ex-military and I know that you served in the military and things, you know, that, that survivor guilt and, and things like that. When you look at shame, it's all encompassing with, with an awful lot of things. You know, if if we as a human being survive something that other people don't, there's going to be a lot of guilt and shame around that. Oh, definitely. I mean all the wars all over the over the globe yeah. uh, and you know you're in a you survive and your your members of the tank that you're in don't survive then besides post-traumatic stress disorder you're most you're going to probably have you're going to probably have survivor guilt as well so you, you, it, it is one of those things like you say that it you know, the majority of people that walk through the door will have, you know, an have amount of shame. Of shame. Yeah. yeah. And it could go as far to say that we live in a shaming society and maybe there's a lot in that. Um, but, you know, I think that the consequences of shame, which is often linked to trauma and the way we're talking here, can run very deep in many of the mental health conditions we're talking about. Yeah. That's why I think the topic we're talking about is so essential to think about. And the cl clinicians, uh, they've got many places to go to read about shame. And there's many books written on the treatment of shame now. 
that weren't around 40 odd years ago when I started. Yeah. And I, th I think, yeah, again, you, you, you do come up with some little gems, Bob. I think we do live in a very shaming society now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. One, one down society. <coughs> yeah. I yeah. Particularly with what's, you know, in, in the news a lot of the time now and everything. Oh, it's, oh. Yeah. It, that's why I love transactional analysis and the, you know, the basic level of, you know, protection permission and potency and i'm okay you're okay and that it's it's i the first, one of the first things i always say to clients is that you know i i'm not the expert in this i don't have all the answers it's something that we work on together you're the expert on you that's a wonderful thing to say and yeah i'm laughing because sorry i'm not laughing i'm i'm smiling at the thought of what i'm, what I'm gonna say because it's a wonderful thing to say and at another level clients come to therapy because they want father christmas in other words they want the client to help them yeah so i know what you're saying is true and there's the desire and the hope that they'll that the therapists will understand and sort of have a magic wand yeah and I hate to disappoint my clients a lot of the time. Yeah, so, when I, say. I know, I know, I know. I, I come from a different place, really. And, and this isn't right or wrong completely. And it's, you know, it's just different. I, I if I have to say that, what you've just said, I would say it later. Yeah. In most, in most cases, because I quite like the idea of what I call idealized transference, where the person can actually have some hope and belief that. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a magic wand. And the, the reason for that, and of course, many people, many people would argue uh, from where you come from is, a, is a, a more, I don't know, preferable clinical direction. However, I, I, I want to get to the younger self, the child eager state. And the best way to do that, I think, is that to have the client on my side. Yeah, 100%. So, it's, you know, I, it, perhaps it's the same and different clinical thinking. Yes, yeah. But around shame, you do need to get to the younger self and you need to get to this whole process, about, process I've talked about, about whose shame is it? Because then at least they can then give it back and realise it was never their shame in the first place. Yeah, which is a really powerful thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Things but like that, I do... They can only do it with the therapist's help because the therapist needs to be more powerful than the person who shamed them in the first place. Yeah. To provide the protection. Yeah. See, again, I, I'm, I'm thinking outside the box here, but when, when a client does hand back the shame, you know, I, I, I've experienced it personally with certain clients that then there's another whole heap load of shame that comes because they feel like they've wasted so much of their life carrying somebody else's shame and then it's kind of like oh we're, we're back to this back to layers of shame yeah and it literally it's like Correct. fool's gold somehow you think you're getting somewhere yeah. and then it comes back even yeah. more sometimes shame is very insidious yeah I used to um, run polo. I used to train uh, horses in the sort of um, realm of polo matches and things like that a long time ago. And I was taught how to, <sighs> and you, you know, how to actually um, do a mane or, 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 or and how you do it. You, you cross over hairs and hairs and you make the knots and you do you do it very carefully and it's a bit like shame you have to follow and untangle the knot and it might go on forever yeah it's a very very shame is very very insidious and it sticks to the soul so we need to you know do some soul we need to cleanse the soul most often the soul with the shame base and often when i used to work uh, with this population i used to use visualizations a lot um where the client would visualize cleansing their soul of the shame 
and yeah. putting it putting in it in a very deep well so it would just go away forever and bring in the lightness and the love and the sunshine i love that i love visualization i think it is really powerful yeah especially in the treatment of shame i think yeah thank you bob i enjoyed that as always good thank you until next time Yes, I look forward to whatever the next subject is. We've got a long list. I've got two A4 pieces of paper, Bob, with lots of titles on it. But I, as I know, I sent the titles to you. I won't go down a spiral for feeling ashamed that I've forgotten um, uh, because I've given that process over to you. <laughs> because you're absolutely right. The one thing I shame is absolutely is, I, is shame is like layers of onion. And you need to go down the layers of the onion very, 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 deep, you know, like cleanse it and deeply and slowly and eventually find the horrible back kernel, the dark kernel that is at the bottom and cleanse that whole process. Yeah. Do you think, just to finish up, do you think people understand that it's shame that they're feeling a lot of the time? No. Do they, they, I, I know no. I, that's what I was thinking. They feel worthless. Yeah. They feel lacking self-esteem. They feel not right. They feel not okay. They feel bizarre. Things are their fault. I can never get it right. Yeah. But those are the sort of thoughts and feelings. And in, until somebody may, and a therapist may do this, may label that as a shaming, uh, a whole process. Where did you get that all from? Yeah they may never think of about it in that way. Yeah. So maybe that's one of the first things is an awareness of shame. <laughs> and really the, angry. Yeah, yeah. I keep going back to that because, because a lifetime of believing you are awful, you are not right, you are the wrong person, it's your fault, is a lifetime of purgatory. Yeah. And I don't... I would need to release people, help clients release themselves from that whole post and give it back to where it, it, it should be. Yeah. And that's not in their soul. No. And, and you know, I, I do firmly believe that, that love and compassion is... Hmm. is Way we don't run out of love and compassion. We can give that to anybody and everybody, whether it's in the therapy room or outside of the therapy room. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Bob. Until next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Speak to you soon. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.